What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Atlas Fallen. A fast-paced action adventure that's going to see us sliding through the sands of a desert kingdom as we fight the power of a corrupted god who has effectively enslaved most of humanity, even if most are still worshipping him. That said, to get my usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. If you're curious about everything that I cover, there's a video linked in the description below, and my Steam profile is public as well. Though, on that note, because I'm bringing you this review a day before it actually launches, which is tomorrow, does mean, of course, that I got a review copy from the game's publisher, Focus Entertainment. Not only did I get a review copy, though, but they sent this out very early. I've had this game in my hands for almost three weeks, and as the 100% only took about 26-27 hours, I had this done before I'd even started Baldur's Gate 3, though I am recording this on the 6th. So as a general overview for this game, as I mentioned, fast-paced action adventure, we're going to be using a variety of combat styles to fight off various what they call wraiths, which are effectively sand monsters, using a source of power called essence to manifest themselves. Humanity has been sort of doomed to mine essence to the detriment of the planet, turning it into a desert wasteland at the behest of a god known as Thelos, who has effectively enslaved everyone. All of humanity's efforts are poured into mining essence for this god, with a lot of people being treated very poorly and any resistance is usually met with immediate death. But once we find a source of power, we can of course take that fight to the various minions of Thelos with some flashy action combat. So from there I want to talk a little bit about the technical state of the game, which is usually what I like to do with new stuff first, and while I did encounter some issues, I did want to mention that everything I encountered was listed in their planned day one patch that they sent me, so theoretically these should be fixed by the time it launches tomorrow, but I'm still going to list them for the sake of completeness and the fact that that is what I experienced, but also because we shall see if they actually get fixed. That said, most of these problems were pretty minor. The biggest one by far was low textures popping in and out. I could usually fix this by just reloading the game, but occasionally all of the texture on armor pieces especially would just disappear, and the game crashed on me exactly one time. Beyond that, occasionally enemies would get sort of stuck, I guess would be the way to put it, where they would just kind of circle in one spot even before eventually it seemed to sort itself out and it'd start following their normal patterns again, which was honestly helpful, if anything, but still kind of an odd issue. Beyond that, though, the game ran pretty well and didn't give me any major trouble besides. Now, moving on to difficulty, there are three difficulties. You can change them on the fly, effectively easy, normal, hard. These do exactly what you'd expect, the health of enemies and how much damage they deal to you. On hard, it is very easy for you to die, which means you have to master the combat system, but you can change these out as much as you want. It's a game that is designed to be played that way, so no need to worry about the difficulty too much. Which brings us to our story setup. As I've pretty much already mentioned, humans are slaving away for a magical thing called essence that they are giving to a god, and we play as one of those human slaves known as an unnamed. However, our journey takes a bit of a different turn when we find a talking gauntlet. This gauntlet grants us a variety of magical powers, which incorporate utilizing the sands around us to form shape-shifting weapons, which is going to allow us to fight back and sort of build up a resistance and tackle this god who has been treating humanity less than kindly, let's say, including, of course, his human followers. Now, outside of that general setup, I would say the story was pretty good. It's linear, as you might imagine. The game itself is technically semi-open world, but the story sees us going through three hubs in a sort of linear fashion, and in each each of those hubs, which you can travel back and forth from freely even after the game so you can get everything pretty easily, are free to be explored and you can run around and do as much as you want, but the story itself is linear. However, I think it is carried by pretty interesting lore and a relatively unique environment. Getting to see how this culture of people has been set up around essentially just mining essence, but even then they're still being attacked by these wraiths, which are also caused by this god. And then learning the secrets of a rebellion that took place a while back that ultimately failed, and then where this magic gauntlet came from that's giving you these powers. And there's a lot of interesting plot points that I enjoyed discovering. However, it does get dragged 
down a bit in places by, I would say, just a bit of double A jank. There's spots where the voice acting isn't really doing the game justice, and other parts where the story moves very, very quickly, which makes it feel like a bit of the secondary focus, because it pretty much is. The main focus is running around and fighting these wraiths with our super-powered abilities, after all. Beyond that, though, I did find the story and the world pretty unique and interesting, even if I felt like it could have been fleshed out a little more. If anything, I wanted to learn more about it, and there just wasn't more to learn. But that brings us to the progression part of the video, and progression can be divided into a few different things. Our gauntlet powers, our armor and its related perks, on top of the momentum and essence system. So our gauntlet does a variety of things for us. For starters, it is our main method of traversal. Our gauntlet is going to give us access to the ability to slide across the sands. It's going to let us do sort of airborne maneuvers, allowing us to jump incredibly great distances and even effectively fly as we fight off flying wraiths. Later, we'll even be able to smash particularly difficult obstacles, and this is done by upgrading our gauntlet. This is mostly related to the story, so I don't necessarily need to walk you through this, but it has a sort of Metroidvania aspect to it in some places where you'll gain powers later on that will then be used to unlock various methods of side progression, such as extra loot and things that you couldn't access previously if you double back for them. Now, one of the most important forms of progression is armor and its perks. Our main method of boosting our stats is armor, which includes offense and defense, alongside a few other metrics you can see here. Armor itself comes in various levels, and each armor can be upgraded generally three times to increase its level, thus increasing your stats. It's important to wear the best armor possible at all times, but they do give you a little variation. That said, there's only about a dozen armor sets in the game, so your choices are usually, do I want more defense and recovery to take enemy hits better, or do I want to go full offense and deal as much damage as possible, though be easier to kill? So when it comes to stat progression, armor is very important, but weapons and attacks and everything are different. We'll get to that in a second. Upgrading your armor, though, gives you access to perk points, which you can then spend on various perks, of course, of which they have several tiers, usually, and these can provide helpful benefits such as starting combat in a better position, finding more materials, etc. In order to upgrade the armor, we have to find materials out in the world, though in my experience these were plentiful and I never really had to worry about it much. The currency is usually what I was lacking, which is the gold that they have called tributes. That brings us to momentum and essence, however. Combat is an interesting concept. As we participate in combat, we will fill up a bar called momentum. As this fills up, we deal more damage and unlock various effects at certain points of momentum. However, in order to fully access this, we have to upgrade our momentum bar, basically unlock spots for it. In these spots, we can slot essence stones, which will grant us various abilities that only unlock once our momentum bar has reached that point. But as the momentum bar increases, we take more and more damage as we deal more as well. This is incredibly customizable though. There are over 150 different essence abilities and the diamond shaped ones are active abilities that you'll be able to use directly in combat with the square ones being passives. So from a progression standpoint, we both have to find all of these essence stones and unlock the spots in the momentum bar to actually use them. And that's where combat gets incredibly customizable as both where you put individual pieces on the momentum bar and exactly what those are buffing in relation to the damage and things that are increasing naturally as you move the momentum up can be pretty interesting. But before we dive into that, let's talk about the gameplay and the world a little bit. As I mentioned, this game utilizes semi-open world hubs. There are three of these ultimately that we are free to explore. You can double back to them and after the game is done, you can continue exploring and finding everything you might have missed. In these open world hubs, we're going to be able to move around quite quickly by sand sliding, which allows us to traverse certain areas very, very quickly. And we're also going to encounter a variety of enemies known as wraiths, which usually comes with completing various activities. As with any open world game, there's a variety of things for us to do around the map as we explore and move about. This can be as simple as finding treasure chests hidden around. We can also unlock various things by completing certain challenges, such as the stones that will give you a almost sort of checkpoint race where you have to make it 
to the next stone it points you towards before the timer runs out, and continue until you reach a reward of some sort. We can also use the gauntlet to find hidden chests. There are also watchtowers we can take out, though this usually just involves a boss fight, and then once that watchtower is cleared, it will open up a few other activities around that watchtower, such as bringing animals and life back to the area. And if you follow animals around long enough in certain spots, they can lead you to other treasures you can find, which can lead to cosmetic rewards, for instance, for your various armors, or useful essence stones, etc. And this is on top of doing actual side quests for the people in the area. There are quite a few side quests to get up to, NPCs to interact with, which is great for learning about the world and everything. So overall, I would say exploring those hub areas and learning more about the world was where I was enjoying the game the most. I was pretty content to just slide around and fight enemies with this interesting combat system and learn more about the world. That said, even this is done in a pretty convenient manner as we can find anvils, as it were, which act as checkpoints where we can do all of our regular tasks such as heal up, upgrade our armor, swap out our momentum or essences and everything, and do our general tasks, but these anvils also serve as fast travel points, which can make getting back to places you've been very easy. And while not really necessary at all, you can find vantage points, which will show you where treasure chests and things in the immediate vicinity are. But with this being a pretty wide open desert landscape, I didn't find those necessary to engage with unless you just really wanted to. Overall though, I enjoyed the world and running around this world probably more than anything else this game had to offer, which made it a pretty satisfying experience. Now let's talk about combat a little bit. As I mentioned, this is a fast paced action system, in which we are going to be combining our weapons and the momentum system to produce various effects. Our gauntlet is going to give us access to three different weapons, some of which takes a little bit of unlocking, but you will get all three of them as part of the story. You can assign two of them as your primary and secondary weapons, which is going to form the basis of your basic attack and damage combos, if you will, as you can sort of string these together as needed to utilize their different range and effectiveness. But the bigger part is really momentum and essence. As we damage enemies and take them out, we'll be gaining momentum, which increases our damage done and taken. As our momentum ability fills up, we will be able to activate and utilize the various essence stones we have unlocked and situated along the momentum bar. And this is really, really customizable. Again, there's like 150 or something of these. So exactly how you want to do this is pretty wide open. However, some enemies will have a usually blue color-coded attack that will drain your momentum, which is really going to slow you down, of course, but also it prevents you from using your shatter ability, because as your momentum goes up and hits certain tiers, you can start performing shatter attacks, which spends all your momentum on one devastating hit. So when you get full momentum and you know something is about to die, you might want to use your shatter ability to just finish the job. Or on particularly large boss fights, you might want to cycle your way through momentum momentum and shattering to ease the transition a little bit, so to speak. Overall, though, just that system is pretty satisfying, but let's talk about the enemies a little bit. There are basic enemies, which only have one health bar. These are pretty standard. You hit them until they die. They will, of course, have various effects, and as you go through the game, they can get stronger and have things like damage blocking from the front, which can make them a little trickier, but generally, these are very simple enemies to fight. However, eventually, you'll start taking on medium and colossal-sized wraiths. These enemies enemies have multiple health bars, one for each part of their body. The red color-coded parts are the things you have to destroy to kill the enemy. The yellow ones are optional, but will get you better loot if you kill the enemy after that. Later on, some enemies actually have unique attacks with certain body parts that can make destroying that body part a bit of a priority, which is usually the case for some of the bigger bosses. And a maxed out shatter is really great because it can usually hit all of these areas all at once and is a great way to finish off enemies that might be giving you a bit of trouble. And this is how we can take on the particularly large enemies by targeting different areas of them and disabling attacks they have as a result, which combined with the momentum and essence stone system, I found to be pretty rewarding once you get the hang of it. There are also other aspects to this, such as parrying and dodging at the right time, which can cause enemies to freeze in place, effectively petrifying them if you get a perfect parry, for instance. And while not wholly necessary on normal difficulty on the higher difficulty, it's really necessary to master that, as enemies will occasionally flash red when they go to attack, and if you can get the parry timing down for those things, you can really pull off some incredible stuff. 
So with combat being a big focus of this game, you would of course hope they nailed it, and I think it's safe to say they did. I had a lot of fun with this combat system and running around the open world. And that brings us to our Steam Deck section. With this game not being released, it does not have an official Steam Deck rating, though I wouldn't recommend it personally. While it does have things like controller support and cloud saves, with the game on even the lowest possible settings, I couldn't get a decent enough frame rate to make this an experience you could play there, as a lot of what is going on is simply too fast-paced and requires you to actually have a good bit of control over what's going on that the incredibly low frame rate here just won't allow. So it's not something I'd really recommend anybody play there, and while someone might eventually find something that works here, in my experience, I just couldn't get this to work on Steam Deck in any way that would be acceptable for this type of gameplay. That, though, brings us to our positives and negatives. Pretty simple thing here. In terms of positives, the game was a lot of fun. Sliding around the sand, fighting all these various enemies with an interesting combat system and an interesting world to explore gave way to a lot of fun moments where I was just kind of taking in the world around me, this sort of beautiful wasteland. And when you're doing those things, that's when the game is at its best. And if that's what you're looking for, I think the game has a lot to offer in that respect. However, on the negative side of things, there were a lot of minor bugs and some janky AA moments. As I mentioned, some of this is planned for their day one patch, but whether or not that actually happens, we shall see. But all the textures popping in and out, enemies kind of getting stuck in place here and there, voice acting being a little off in places, and then just other parts of the game that you can tell just lack a certain amount of polish here and there are probably what's going to eat into this experience for most people. But for me, they weren't enough to outweigh how much fun I was having with the rest of the game. That brings us to our conclusion. I would say Atlas Fallen is really fun, but it's not exactly groundbreaking. It isn't really bringing anything new to the table in terms of mechanics or anything like that, but the gameplay itself is a lot of fun, the combat's fun, exploration is fun, the world itself is very interesting. And seeing how the problems I had with the game were pretty minor, for me, I would say it gets a buy, with its full price here in the US being $50 and whatever that amounts to regionally. However, as a side note, Atlas Fallen is releasing kind of in the middle of a large quantity of game releases this year, and because it doesn't really do anything to push the envelope, While I think this game is worth buying, I also think a lot of people are probably going to pass this one by in favor of the variety of other games releasing around the same time. But if you find yourself with some free time and you're looking for a fun game to play, I think this might scratch that itch for you. That has been my review for Atlas Fallen. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.